Transfiguration Sunday, we will hear a familiar story according to the gospel, according to Matthew. But first, let us pray. Our understanding of your word comes from you, O God. Open our ears and our minds and our hearts to hear what you would have to say to us. Help us upon hearing to understand and upon understanding to act in Jesus' name. Amen. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and his brother John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And Jesus was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. Then Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will make three dwellings here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, suddenly a bright cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud a voice said, This is my son, the beloved. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell to the ground and were overcome by fear. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Get up and do not be afraid. And when they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus ordered them, tell no one about the vision until after the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It is good for us to be here, Peter said. And who would not have wanted to be where he was? He, James, and John were having the ultimate and mountaintop experiences. Moses, Elijah, and Jesus all there together in the same place, dazzling white clothes, radiant faces, the very voice of God. While it may not be on the same par as having Jesus transfigured or his dazzling white clothes, we do know what a mountaintop experience is like, don't we? That special place, that retreat, that vista, that moment when everything makes sense, when everything is crystal clear and uncomplicated, when it seems as if God is right there beside us. Let's build booths. I wish we could stay here forever. I never want to leave. One commentator writes, God gives us mountaintop experiences that are transformative. They change the way we see the world and ourselves. Business as usual is no longer possible after you've seen the vision of God's good future revealed to us in Jesus Christ. Such experiences give us confidence in the presence and power of God's steadfast love that endures forever, and they sustain us through trials and tribulations. The story of the transfiguration of Jesus comes in the midst of a huge roller coaster of high and low moments in Matthew's gospel. Just a few days before they ascend the mountain, Jesus asks the disciples, who do you say that I am? Peter responds, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God, a true moment of epiphany. And then, and then Peter turns right around and rebukes Jesus because Jesus begins to tell him he's got to go to Jerusalem, undergo great suffering, be killed, and on the third day be raised. That doesn't fit Peter's idea of the Messiah. And to make matters more confusing, Jesus tells him, if you want to be my disciples, deny yourselves, take up your cross, and follow me. Definitely a downer. And then... The glory and awe of the transfiguration. Only to come down from that glorious mountain with the admonition from Jesus to tell no one about the vision. Ups and downs, highs and lows, insight and confusion. And here we are at that transition point between the season of Epiphany and the season of Lent. There are no mountaintop experiences in the season of Lent. Things are definitely going to get a whole lot messier and confusing before they get better. Conflict and tension are ahead, and a Messiah who must go through the deepest, darkest valley before the dawn of Easter morning. 
Yes, we know those mountaintop moments. We also know those deep, dark valleys, those times of disorientation and despair and discouragement, when everything seems complicated, when the pain seems unending, when God seems anywhere, anywhere else but nearby. Rather than wanting to hang around, we are most ready and happy to move right on through those times as quickly as possible. The dark valley is not a place where we want to linger. You've most likely heard the story of the burglar who broke into a house one night. He turned on his flashlight to look into this dark room for valuables when a voice says, Jesus is watching you. The burglar nearly jumped out of his skin. He clicked off his flashlight and he stood there, frozen in the dark. After a bit, when he heard nothing more, shook his head, turned his flashlight back on and continued to canvas for valuables. Just as he pulled out the stereo and was about to snip the wires, he heard that same voice say, Jesus is watching you. His flashlight pierced through the dark as he looked frantically for the source of that voice and finally in the corner of the room, his flashlight beam came to rest on a parrot. Did you say that? He asked the parrot. Yep, the parrot <laughs> confessed. Then the bird squawked, I'm just trying to warn you that he is watching you. The burglar relaxed, I see, warn me, and tell me who you are. Moses, replied the bird. <laughs> Moses, the burglar laughed, what kind of people would name a bird Moses? Same kind of people who would name the Rottweiler Jesus. <laughs> congregation I served as pastor some 20 years ago in Charleston, West Virginia, is located in Kanawha County, and it, like every other county in West Virginia, is within the region of Appalachia, as we are. One of the first things I did after arriving on the scene was to spend a day with the good folks at the Coalition for Appalachian Ministries. And the highlight of the day was the opportunity to take a tour of a working coal mine. After a detailed presentation on safety measures, our group donned the appropriate clothing and gear, including hard hat and lamp, and then boarded an elevator that took us way, way down into the earth. And the final leg of the journey was on a man trip, the name of that rail car that takes you on back into the mine. We went back another mile to the working face. At one point, our guide gathered the group together and asked us to turn off our lights. The result was the darkest dark I have ever experienced in my life. Totally and completely void of light. It was so dark I could wave my hand two inches in front of my nose and could not see it. Had I been by myself, it would have been more than a little unnerving. Those who scuba dive talk about a similar darkness. The farther they go down into the water, in the ocean, the darker it obviously becomes. And there's a point where it becomes so dark that a number of divers will turn around and head back up to the surface. The darkness is just too overwhelming, they say. But those who continue to go deeper reach what's called the twilight zone. It's that area between there's just a tiny, tiny amount of sunlight, almost non-existent, and in that deeper, deeper level called the midnight zone. And those who trust their training and muster up their courage to reach the twilight zone discover a fascinating phenomenon. It isn't entirely dark at all. There are living organisms there that light up. One preacher I heard recently described this as an illuminous darkness. Now, scientifically, that might not be an entirely accurate term, since there are luminous organisms that put off light, and there are illuminous objects that reflect light. Be that as it may, there is light in the darkness, and I think it will work for this purpose, so stay with me here. <laughs> Peter and James and John came down from the mountain with the admonition to tell no one about their vision tell no one about what they had seen until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. They'd witnessed a radiant, transfigured Jesus, 
those exhilarating, albeit terrifying moments had to have been seared into the memory. How could they see Jesus the same way after that? How could they not say something? And just why couldn't they stay up there forever? Because then, like now, there was work to be done down below. And that work could not happen if they erected booths for Moses and Elijah and Jesus. And that work cannot happen now if we stay in that idyllic setting or never come back from vacation. Welcome home, Trig. We get a glimpse of what that work looks like when we read the rest of Matthew 17 and on into the remainder of the gospel, healing the sick, feeding the hungry, freeing the captives, going into all the world to teach and baptize and make disciples. If God's glory is going to shine in this world, it's going to be through folks like James and Peter and John and you and me. We cannot stay on that mountaintop. We have work to do right here right now. Mahatma Gandhi said, I do not want to foresee the future. I'm concerned with taking care of the present. God has given me no control over the moment following. The present moment is all that we have. It's all that's there. We can recall the past. We can plan for the future, but the only concrete reality is right now. Having said that, how do we muster the courage to enter the season of Lent? How can we possibly make the descent down from the mountain and continue on the journey with Jesus to Jerusalem, knowing what lies ahead? Now, this is where I think that luminous darkness comes back into play. Here's what I shared near the beginning of this meandering sermon. God gives us mountaintop experiences that are transformative. They change the way we see the world and ourselves. Business as usual is no longer possible after you've seen the vision of God's good future revealed to us in Jesus Christ. Such experiences give us confidence in the presence and power of God's steadfast love that endures forever, and they sustain us through trials and tribulations. Transformative experiences that change the way we see the world and ourselves. Business as usual, is no longer possible. Peter and James and John were different for having been up on that mountaintop. I didn't always translate into clarity and courage back down in the valley. More than once, it was just the opposite, even to the point of Peter denying his Lord. But it eventually made sense to them after that stone had been rolled away on Easter morning. There's a striking image in the last Harry Potter book. You Harry Potter fans may remember, Harry is attending the wedding of his two dear friends, Bill and Fleur. Fleur is beautiful, magically beautiful, so much so her beauty usually eclipses everyone around her. But on her wedding day, Fleur wears a special tiara that was made for her by special elves. The tiara exerts a different sort of magic, and when she puts it on, the tiara transfigures those around her. She's no longer the center of attention. Instead, everyone around her seems to glow. Her tiara reminds, renders others beautiful, and the wedding guests can't understand how they never noticed it before, how the faces of those around them shine. And that is the illuminous darkness. The faces around us that shine, your face that shines. The radiance of the transfigured Christ is reflected in and through all of us who make up the body of Christ, through our hands, through our words, through our lives. That's what gives us enough light for the Lenten journey with all of its twists and turns and shadows. Just enough light. And the more we do that together, the more light we have. Back some four decades ago, Paul Stuckey wrote the song, John Henry Bosworth. Here's how it ends. And I was wondering if you had been to the mountain to look at the valley below, 
Did you see all the roads tangled down in the valley? Did you know which way to go? Oh, the mountain stream runs pure and clear, and I wish to my soul I could always be here. But there's a reason for living way down in the valley that only the mountain knows. There's a reason for living way down in the valley that only the mountain knows. It's good for us to be here, Peter said. But now, let us be going.